China wants to be the world's leading power, wants to supplant the United States in that, in that number one position. And on the way to achieving that global objective, it needs to establish dominance in, in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific. And to do that, it's bringing together all the arms of state power in a very coordinated strategy, uh, economic inducements, investment, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, but it's also using military power, cyber power, uh, foreign interference in other countries to build out a position of influence right across the region. We've seen the West react a certain way to Russian aggression in Ukraine. Could the West take on a resurgent China in, this, in a similar situation? Well, I think uh, what's commendable is that the West really came together in a sort of coherent, uh, as someone was saying, strategic coherence. A very coherent response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think that's the sort of unity and uh, coherence and consistent policy that's required to, you know, manage and compete with China in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think we are doing our best to manage a muscular China. Um, we've had mixed success so far. Uh, the Chinese are testing boundaries wherever they can. Uh, fortunately, I think when they meet resistance, they have pulled back and where they've been able to take an inch and not meet resistance is when things get dangerous and they take more. And we saw that in the South China Sea. Uh, fortunately, when they've tried to test the boundaries here in the Himalayas, uh, the Indians have put up a stiff resistance and the Chinese have been forced to stand down. Uh, we need to remember the judiciary system. Court cannot work without police. Uh, verdict is there. But perpetrator just ignore it. This is not a uh, rule-based order. We need the police. We need the power. In the international system, we need the power too. I can prove it. For example, what happened in South China Sea? Um, when China expands territory, the, there is a power vacuum. For example, in 1950s, when the France withdrew from Indochina, they occupied the Paras half of the Paracel Island. And in the 1970s, when U.S. withdrew from uh, Vietnam, China occupied another half of the Paracel Island. In 1980s, the Soviet troops reduced the number in Vietnam. China expanded uh, the activity in the Spiratory Island and occupied six features. And in 1990s, when the U.S. withdrew from Philippines, China occupied the mischief reefs. So military balance has changed, and they find the power vacuum, they take it. If so, we, if we maintain the uh, military balance, this could be the police. It's a big question, as you well know, um, and the West is a big question. So I think that um, it's a big challenge. Uh, it's the current crisis uh, in Russia and in Ukraine certainly gives us some hope uh, that Europe, the United States, Canada, but actually far beyond that the coalition of those who are willing to rise to a genuine threat, to a real challenge is actually quite significant. And so I think the big question is whether the gains that have been made in terms of economic cooperation on sanctions can be translated into a more sustained effort to really hold the line on questions of technology transfer, deterrence uh, in South China Seas in, and across the Indo-Pacific. Um, but it's going to become more difficult uh, as this current war drags on, as the Russia-China axis uh, becomes even stronger, uh, and as countries uh, learn that they have you know, overlapping but not exactly the same interests uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. I would definitely say yes, and they have to stand up, but not stand up to fight against it. Stand up and try to find a way to cooperate with it. Well, I don't think that the West will probably be able to do it alone. And also, I think we are not there yet, at least in the European Union, that we really have decided to stand up. Yes, we are more and more pushing back 
on certain issues, but we still seek cooperation with China because in Europe you still have the conviction that certain global issues like climate change, like non-proliferation cannot be solved, you know, uh, if you have a co uh, confrontational stance with China. I think it is challenging, but uh, look, if you look at the West, you need to understand that the, the Western politics and the Western morality stems from the, the core principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, where individuals are at the center of, of anything that they do. But probably the, the sense of morality that comes from China is totally different, right? And if you were to ask about the Eastern civilization and the civilization that we have in India and Nepal, our morality comes from uh, an old Sanskrit code, which says, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santaniramai, which puts values in the other's happiness and other's well-being. So I think the standing against China or, or India or the West, it stems from, again, the mor moral foundations on which the West stands. And probably the moral foundation of China is totally different to the Western moral foundation. So it's not about standing against China. It's about a different moral foundation or a different lens that they look into the world through. Of course the West can and the West should. In fact, the West has an obligation to. An obligation to who? To humanity? Well, speaking from a legal perspective as, you know, a lawyer, um, countries like Canada, uh, most of Europe, the US, all these countries have ratified the Genocide Convention, among other human rights treaties, which actually imposes on them obligations to respect human rights. Whether the free world can stand up to China and beat it, beat its, its totalitarian, mercantilistic, authoritarian revisionism, yes, we absolutely can. We have the will, we have the resources, we have the ability to do so. We just need to convince ourselves that we can and build the resolve to do it. Absolutely. I think that the Western model of governance is one based on democracy, freedom, creativity. Uh, and the Chinese model is one that is based on exactly the opposite. And history has borne out that democracy has a capacity to adjust and make periodic adjustments. And authoritarian systems when they crash, they crash rapidly and crash very hard. Uh, and so I have a lot of um, faith in the democratic model to provide that kind of adjustment necessary. Look, the West is going to have to um, manage a muscular China, whether it likes it or not. And it's going to have to do so, I mean, the various countries of the West are going to have to figure out a modus operandi where they put their differences aside and come together over national interests. And that includes, I think, um, a lot of countries which are not what we would usually call like-minded. There's been quite a lot of talk about like-minded states rallying together, defending democracy, but there's a lot of states in China's region uh, for whom that message will not penetrate because they do not have the same type of governments. Well, it has to, right? The point is, can China manage to be muscular with a West that has finally understood that they can be united against a common enemy, although we we'll never define China as an enemy yet. But if there's one thing that this Ukraine conflict has proven, is that the West is not as divided as many may think, right? So yes, it can manage uh, muscular China. The problem is, how much would the cost be for the world? In reality, I would not expect the EU to be as engaged in any sort of a conflict that is not on European territory. And we have to be frank about that. I mean, I think that the EU will, of course, um, give a lot of statements and EU officials, they will give a lot of statements, they will speak very firmly uh, about, uh, you know, EU's future position. But let's be frank, what has united Europe in this case, in the case of the war in Ukraine, is uh, the sense of immediate threat, the sense that their immediate security has been endangered. Um, whether th that sentiment would exist in case uh, China invaded Taiwan, it's hard to tell, but I would assume that it would not be the same. I'm not sure we should continue to talk about the West. It sounds more like a nostalgic notion to me. How to maintain military balance is very important uh, uh, policy. We should seek cooperation, and uh, for example, uh, crowd cooperation, 
China need to divide their military budget. Japan side, Indian side, Australian side, or Southeast Asian side, or in the US is also, US side is everywhere. In, when the European join this, they need to share for the European too. In this case, China need to divide their uh, ample budget in multi directions. To maintain military balance, it is more easy. That's why this cooperation can work to deter China's aggression. Uh, we can do that, and the uh, democratic side can win, indeed. Of course, it can stand up. The intention has to be there. We are looking at the Indo-Pacific and the Quad, and I think they are big and great initiatives. The only trouble is that uh, we have not spelled out exactly what it is. We are still stuck on the COVID-related issues. So I think the more we talk about military alliances, I think that is how uh, you know we can have uh, something against China and I think this Indo-Pacific strategy is a great one uh, against China that needs to be built on and the European powers have to come in like they have already come in but they have to uh, really come in big and support the Indo-Pacific strategy. I think that we all need to form a web of partnerships whether it's bilaterally, plurilaterally, multilaterally or through the Quad or AUKUS or other such stellar organizations. Well it already is and it can do a lot more. It doesn't mean the West won't get bruised along the way, but uh, the West has a lot more assets. It's ultimately got better uh, R&D technology. It's got a huge network that extends from India through Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Mexico, US, Canada, Europe, Israel, UAE. The Chinese can't match that. So over time, I think you can see the development of new supply chains, and certainly a lot more resiliency because you have a network as opposed to one, one behemoth. Do you believe that the Chinese really have no natural allies? Very hard for them to have allies unless they um, blandish, give blandishments or coerce them. Individually, this country is small than China. But we gather the power and we will be big. We can win.